Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Today is Advent Sunday. Our Advent wreath has appeared and we're going to light the first candle of the Advent wreath. And so we join together in the Advent candle prayer. Lord Jesus, light of the world, born in David's city of Bethlehem, born like him to be a king. Be born in our hearts at Christmas, be king of our lives today. Amen. For me, Advent provides the very best of the hymns and Hugh and I both agree that Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending is a really good one for us to celebrate Advent together.
Trinity, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are opened, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For Collect for Advent Sunday. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 64, beginning at the first verse. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains tremble before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O oh Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel, it was written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 13, beginning at verse 26. At that time men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the Gospel of the Lord. As a teenager, <clears throat> growing up in the 60s, I bought the LP of Beyond the Fringe, starring Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett and Jonathan Miller. It became a successful stage show in London and on Broadway. From it, I memorised the spoof of an Anglican sermon by Alan Bennett, which I used over and over again in reviews and uh, end of term shows. But it was a different sketch I remembered when I came to think about today's Gospel reading. It's called The End of the World. A group gather on a mountain to escape the inferno which they have calculated, according to the ancient scrolls, should be in two minutes time. They chant, now is the end, perish the world. Then. Two minutes later, the leader says, well, it's not quite the conflagration we've been banking on. Never mind, lads, same time tomorrow, we must get a winner one day. People have always been entranced by end of the world scenarios, and perhaps especially Americans. Perhaps that's because their national history is relatively short, or perhaps it's because their roots are less deeply planted, making uprooting less frightening. Those who jumped on the apocalyptic bandwagon were those who had the least to lose in the event of a widespread world meltdown. Recent immigrants without a stake in their new country sometimes decided to send their hopes heavenward instead of seeking roots downward. The poorest, the disenfranchised, those individuals pushed to the edges and margins of life because of their race, their education, their disabilities, or just plain poverty, have always been rich soil for end-of-the-world anxiety and general unhappiness. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a particularly bad record in predicting the end of the world. They made emphatic claims about the years 1799, 1874, 
1878, 1914, 1918 and 1925 in the Watchtower Society's publications. Each time they claimed that this year, whichever it was, would bring the presence of Jesus Christ, the beginning of the last days and the destruction of worldly governments. We must get a winner one day. But before we laugh too much, do you remember all the panic at the time of the millennium and the Y2K bug in computers? Planes would drop from the skies, all our money would be useless. People stocked up on food, water and guns in anticipation of a computer-induced apocalypse, which didn't happen. There has never been any shortage of end-of-the-world scenarios. Even the page in Wikipedia, list of dates predicted for apocalyptic events, has the note, this is a dynamic list and may never be able to satisfy particular standards for completeness. And of course, the genuine effects of climate change feed such scenarios. The grimness of our environmental condition is relentlessly gloomy. Technological breakthroughs, unaccompanied by spiritual breakthroughs, can be apocalyptic. And of course, a truly worldwide pandemic like COVID-19 doesn't help matters at all. In today's reading, Jesus says, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert, you do not know when that time will come. Did you hear that? Not even the earthly Jesus knew everything. There is something kept hidden from Jesus himself. And that something is the very thing that some people profess to know, despite the fact that Jesus didn't, the day or the hour of the end. For faithful Christian believers, taking a full part in the kingdom of God is much more important than not cataloguing or calculating apocalyptic appearances and disasters. Jesus has called his disciples, whether in the first or the 21st century, to live fully and faithfully in the time that Almighty God has given us. And he will take care of the day or the hour of the end. When we moved to Bournemouth six years ago, we had to do some drastic sorting out to move from a five bedroom vicarage on three floors to a three bedroom flat. It was mostly a healthy experience and it's only occasionally we regret, uh, only occasionally we regret something we took to a charity shop. Now imagine your faith is a bit like that house. There are different rooms, some are really tidy and sorted out with everything beautifully laid out. Some have got lovely pictures in, some rooms you're ready and proud to show to visitors. What's like that in your faith, the bits you're really pleased with? But some rooms in that house are like a tip, full of boxes and junk and you can't find anything. Some things you keep hidden away, so that no one else knows that they're there because there are some parts about which you're rather embarrassed. What's like that in your faith? I don't know if you remember the TV programme about 15 years ago called Life Laundry. It tried to help transform people's homes by helping them to clear out their clutter and ditch their junk. Each week, it forced families to empty out all the contents of their cluttered home onto the back lawn before deciding what stays and what goes. It's only by letting go of the stuff that they've hoarded 
and confronting the emotional attachments these items represent that the families can have the clutter-free homes they desperately crave. What about your faith? If you had to lay out all the things that are in your house of faith, what things would you keep as essential? What things couldn't you live without? What things ultimately are junk? Some things might be very precious, even pretty, but they might also be junk. What about clothes? Do we worry about what we should wear to church? What about people? We might even have views on what sort of people should be in our church. What about Bibles? What if we had none? Lots of Christians throughout the world don't have access to Bibles. What about particular services? What would it mean for us if we couldn't have Holy Communion together in church ever again? What about buildings? What would it mean for us if we didn't have a building to worship in? What about ways of doing things? What if our tradition, our ways of doing things were done away with? Advent is a kind of faith laundry. It can help us to differentiate between the essentials and the junk, which things are temporary and which couldn't we cope without in our faith. For the Jews of Jesus' time, the one thing they believed that they couldn't manage without was the temple in Jerusalem. The first temple had been built by Solomon in about 1000 BC. The second temple was built in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah about 500 BC. In Jesus' time, the temple had only recently been renovated by Herod. But Jesus says at the beginning of this chapter, Mark 13, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Surely not. Yet we know that the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. The prophecy of Jesus was fulfilled. Jesus was not only predicting that specific downfall, He's also saying more generally that eventually all human structures and systems fall. It wasn't just the temple that would be destroyed, the whole structure of the Jewish faith from that time on would be changed. Because there is no temple in Jerusalem, for the Jews' worship is synagogue worship, and that will stay until there is a third temple. How do we, as Jesus' disciples, view things like buildings, some of those things we considered earlier, human structures, human systems, human traditions? What would we do if they were taken away? We live in a very uncertain world, one that is rapidly changing. Things we once may have considered to be lasting are now under threat. Some have gone already in this uncertain and changing world. Jesus tells us not to be deceived, not to follow any and all claims of stability and authority. Jesus tells his followers not to be alarmed and not to allow themselves to be led astray, to trust completely in him. And the reason is because we don't need to be unsettled. These things must happen. They're not going to go away. Temporary things are under threat, but the words of Jesus stand firm for all time. Our passage ends with the parable of the waiting servants. The master of the house clearly stands for Jesus and he has in mind the period of time that will elapse between his ascension and his second coming. He also stresses three times in this short reading our ignorance of the time of his return. He has previously said 
of that day and hour no one knows. Verse 32. Then he said, you do not know when the time is. Verse 33. And now he says, you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Verse 35. Jesus really didn't want us to miss the point, did he? He wanted us to know with certainty that we can't know when he will return. But he also didn't want us to misunderstand what this not knowing means. It shouldn't lead to apathy, but rather to awareness of our responsibility. It shouldn't lead to endless speculation about the future, but rather to striving to live as we ought to live, as we await his return. Some people have the idea, we don't know when Jesus is coming, so it doesn't really matter. Others have the idea, we don't know when Jesus is coming, so we have to find out and set a date. The right response is, I don't know when Jesus is coming, so I have to be alert, eager, and ready for his coming. And in the last verse, Jesus expands the application of the parable regarding watchfulness beyond his first disciples to all believers. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So we, his disciples, have a special obligation not only to watch for Jesus' return, but also to watch out for the church, to watch out for our fellow believers. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We say together in faith, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We believe in God the Father, who created all things, for by his will they were created and had their being. We believe in God the Son, who was slain, for with his blood he purchased us for God from every tribe and language, from every people and nation. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Let us pray. Watchful at all times, let us pray for strength to stand with confidence before our Maker and Redeemer. That God may bring in his kingdom with justice and mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy that God may establish among the nations his sceptre of righteousness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may seek Christ in the scriptures and recognise him in the breaking of the bread. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That God may bind up the brokenhearted, restore the sick, and raise up all who have fallen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the light of God's coming may dawn on all who live in darkness and the shadow of death. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That with all the saints in light, we may shine forth as lights for the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, as your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, first came to seek and to save the lost, so may he come again to find in us the completion of his redeeming work. For he is now alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, God of David, for your faithfulness is steadfast, and your mercy has been from of old. You draw your people to, with, to you with your promise of salvation, and every promise you make in your goodness you fulfil. From the house of David you raised up your Messiah to restore Judah and to herald that your deliverance was near. In your Son's righteousness we find our life, for his righteousness was more than enough for your people, who had waited so long for justice, who had yearned so long for redemption who had trusted so long in your grace. Truly, in his righteousness is fulfilled every hope of salvation in every generation. By his death we can stand justified before you, and through his resurrection we can share your holy life forever. And so, with angels and archangels, we praise your name, joining the company of heaven in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of glory, for whose coming we wait, make this meal we share, the sign that our redemption draws near. Send your Holy Spirit upon your church, strengthen our hearts in all holiness, that we may be heralds of your kingdom. By your same Spirit, sanctify this bread and this cup, that they may be for us, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who at supper with his disciples took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, Again he gave you thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, 
which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ is the bread of life. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. God of power, you have promised to make your way to us, come quickly to those who wait for you. Raise up every head that is bent low, lift up every heart that is bowed down, uphold every soul that is made heavy by oppression, inspire every weary throat to sing of a day when justice and mercy may Bring us through all that is passing away to the life that shall never pass away. Where every eye shall be lifted up to gaze upon your Son in everlasting glory with all your saints. And when the redemption for which we have longed shall forever be ours in the company of your Son and the power of your Spirit. Holy Father, Blessed Trinity. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We join together. My Jesus, I love you above all things. How I long to receive you with my brothers and sisters at the table you have prepared. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in bread and wine, I ask you to feed me with the manner of your Holy Spirit and nourish me with your holy presence. I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from your love. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.